Hey guys, Buildzoid here from Actually Hardcore Overclocking, and today we're going to be taking a look at Gigabyte's X570 flagship, the Gigabyte X570 Aorus Extreme. And I'm a huge fan of this motherboard. Like, th this is one of those motherboards where it's like, I want this just because of the VRM that's on there. Because this is the first motherboard ever to have a true 14 plus 2 phase VRM. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake's Ring Duo 12 radiator fans. The Ring Duo 12 fan kit comes with three ARGB 120mm fans with a controller, and each fan equipped with 18 LEDs and a diffuser for a glowing color inside of the fan range. The fans are made for use on radiators and use hydraulic bearings for long lifespan, rated at 40,000 hours for the fan. The fans have an RPM range of 500 to 1500, giving the ability to quiet down the fans under low load or boost them for heavy workloads. The Ring Duo 12s are available now. Learn more at the link in the description below. So this section right here is your V-Core. And this right here is your SOC. And this is one, two, three, 14 phases. And there's not a single doubler anywhere on this motherboard. Oh, and then we have plus two for, for our SOC. Two phase SOC power, that's not a big deal. That's pretty much standard for high end uh, motherboards since like X. Actually on X370, there was a bunch of motherboards which had four phase SOC power. Anyway, here we have uh, a 14 plus two and there's not a single doubler in this. And it's not the Asus put your power stages in parallel and b act like it's to two separate phases when they're actually running in phase with each other. So. No, this, this is a proper 14 phase. Every single one of these phases is independently current balanced uh, and uh, can be switched on and off at the discretion of the voltage controller, depending on how much current is being, uh, how much current output the VRM has to provide. And the way this is achieved is this chip right over here. That is a Infineon XDPE, uh, and that's not a P, 132G5C. This is Infineon's brand new um, they like to market it as their 1000 amp uh, voltage controller solution um, because this is really meant for like high-end exotic uh, data center CPUs and that kind of thing. So, you know, um, IBM stuff that pulls a ton of power, has a bunch of cores, tons of threads, um, and just you'll never see in a consumer platform. So that's really what this chip is meant for it for, you know, huge pieces of silicon that just pull a ton of power. I guess thread, I guess technically Epic would kind of fall into that category if Epic was overclockable, but <laughs> which it isn't, but maybe AMD will decide to put out like a four gigahertz base clock version of Epic that just pulls a stupid amount of current, in which case, yeah, that's that's the kind of thing this chip is meant for, because this is a true 16 phase voltage controller. And that means, you know, Gigabyte can have all of these phases with all of the benefits of having all of these phases, but none of the downsides of having doublers, because um, doublers basically add a little bit of delight to your PWM signals. And there are ways to work around that. Um, but, you know, why work around having doublers when you could just not have doublers and still have all of the benefits of having uh, 14 phases. Though I would argue for a Ryzen 3000 series CPU, there's basically no benefits to having an actual four feet 14 phase. But um, Giga, like this is the X570 Aorus Extreme. If if for some re if suddenly Ryzen started pulling a thousand watts, this VRM would suddenly become very very fitting. So and and currently, I would dare say that this is probably the most advanced uh, voltage regulator you'll see on a consumer motherboard. I'm not sure what's happening in the service space. I don't really pay that much attention to it. And the same thing is true of the power stages here. So, uh, you know, we have the latest and greatest voltage controller combined with the latest and greatest power stage. These are TDA 21472s from uh, in International Rectifier slash Infineon. Infineon owns International Rectifier for a while now, so you can basically consider them the same thing at this point. Um, these are 70 amp smart power stages. And the reason why smart power stages are called smart power stages is because unlike normal power stages, they integrate current monitoring, temperature monitoring, overcurrent protection, over temperature protection. Uh, the current monitoring that they integrate is actually also more accurate than what you'd have on say like a power IR stage, which those integrated current monitoring, but basically there's a new stat, like the, the smart power stages are actually like a new power stage standard from Intel for they're high-end server platforms. That's that's what these chips are also designed for. So yeah, um, basically, you know, this VRM is absolutely insane. So with 14 phases of 70 amp smart power stages, 
you end up with a VRM that, quite frankly, doesn't hit peak efficiency. Like, the, the thing is, um, since this is a true 14-phase controller, depending on how Gigabyte has it programmed, um, if you're not running, like, a maxed out 12 or 16 core Ryzen CPU, most of this VRM will probably not turn, like, shouldn't be turning on because it'll just waste power. Because um, uh, if you look at the efficiency curve for any any power stage, it looks like this. Um, so, at, it, like, if if you're there's a sweet spot in terms of current output where you get peak efficiency, and then anywhere below that, you should just not be running that many phases. And the, the curve I drew the curve a bit wrong. It's normally a bit more like that. But anyway, you get the idea. So. This VRM is absolutely ridiculous overkill if you're going to run something like a 12, uh, 8 core. And I'd argue even the 12 core, this is going to be ridiculous overkill. But anyway, 400 kilohertz uh, switching frequency per phase, which is actually relatively on the low side, but Gigabyte does actually normally default to that. These power stages technically support up to like 1.5 megahertz switching frequency. So, you know, if, if you wanted to throw all the extra efficiency you got out for better output ripple and less input ripple, um, you, you could just crank up the switching frequency to ridiculous levels. And uh, then the 14 phases might actually be useful because your per phase power loss would would go up quite drastically, um, especially if you were pushing a significant amount of current per phase. Anyway, 400 kilohertz, because um, that's just convenient because that's where the data sheet is specced at. Uh, 1.2 volts out because, again, that's where the data sheet is specced. Um, and they unfortunately do not give a nice uh, power efficient, like power uh, heat dissipation to uh, voltage curve, um, like some of the past power, some other power stages do. So we're we're just going to go with 1.2 volts. Ultimately, it's not going to make a huge difference in terms of the uh, overall heat output. Um, if you go from 1.2 volts to like 1.4, it's not going to make that much difference. 100 amps output is around what you'd be looking at for like a Ryzen first gen 8 core. I would assume that the third gen 8 cores will also run around 100 amps as well. And a Ryzen 6 core would be below that. Well, 100 amps output, this VRM will produce about 9 watts of heat. The VRM does not need a heat sink at all. <laughs> in, in fact, um, the, the X570 Aorus Extreme is one of the few motherboards on X570 with a completely passive uh, passive chipset cooling system. And you'll notice that the, the way the cooling is designed on this motherboard, you have the chipset heatsink, and then there's a heat pipe that goes from the chipset heatsink into the VRM heatsink. I honestly... I think that ch that that chipset heatsink is completely passive, mostly because the VRM doesn't produce enough heat for the, for there to be a need. Like ba basically, what's happening is the chipset is probably heating up the VRM more so than the VRM heating up the actual VRM heatsink. So yeah, that that's that that, that the, the the cooling system on this motherboard is mostly there for the chipset. 150 amps, you can't even hit that on like a 2700X. Um, well, you can, but if your 2700X is doing 150 amps, it's not going to last very long because you're going to be pushing way too much voltage. So you could de degrade and completely destroy a 2700X with this motherboard while still not having a VRM heatsink on it because it'll still produce only about 13 watts of heat. It's, it's extreme. <laughs> it's very extreme. Going up to 200 amps output, which is... Um, Probably where like even the 16 core maxes out for, for Ryzen 3rd gen. By the sounds of the, the power consumption that these chips are hitting, that sounds to be the upper limit of what uh, any Ryzen 3000 seri series CPU will ever pull. Um, and at that point, the or at least on like ambient cooling, and at that point, this motherboard should be producing about 16 watts of heat. Uh, the motherboard still wouldn't care. <laughs> so yeah, the, the like... You know, when, when you build a VRM that, quite frankly, puts most X299 motherboards to shame, can you really be surprised that it can handle 200 amps output um, with only 16 watts of heat dissipation? Like, yeah, the board very much deserves the name it's given. Now, if we go on, like, I don't know how uh, Ryzen 3000 will scale on liquid nitrogen, but I, I don't think it'll scale high enough for this motherboard to care that much anyway, because even at 300 amps output, this board will be only producing about 24 watts of heat. Going up to 400 amps output, it'll produce only about 35 watts of heat. And going up to 500 amps output, it will finally produce something where it's like, you know, a, a significant amount of heat at 47 watts of heat. Now, admittedly, from basically 24 watts up, you're gonna want a VRM heatsink. From in excess of 35 watts, you'd 
uh, are, you'd need like a substantial VRM heatsink, or maybe if it's not so substantial, you'd need some airflow. This is all very much like extreme overclocking territory on liquid nitrogen. And at that point, you're not going to be running very long, uh, you know, like very long duration uh, stress tests. So you, you still probably wouldn't need to worry about the VRM cooling even then. Uh, so this board's VRM is just awesome. It's just very, very des deserving of, of the extreme label. And uh, quite possibly this is the, actually as so far, I'm pretty sure this is the best VRM on X570. There's just, as far as I'm aware, there's not a single motherboard that gets even close to this um, because most of the other board vendor, actually, as far as I know, all of the other board vendors are still using the IR35201. I, I've not yet seen a motherboard other than Gigabytes that uses the XDPE132G5C. So yeah, Gig Gigabyte has just kind of absolutely, you know, knocked it out of the park here. And the funny thing is, Gigabyte in the past used to do things like this a lot. Um, if you go far back enough in, in motherboard history, um, Gigabyte used to do motherboards with absolutely ridiculous power delivery solutions, just kind of on the regular. If they, their, their top of the line motherboard just basically always had the most overkill VRM you could find for the platform, um, with, uh, a few exceptions. For example, on HEDT where there's not enough space, Gigabyte's plan to just cram phases kind of wouldn't work out a lot of the time. On mainstream platforms, yeah, th this is this isn't really like th th this is sort of gigabyte standard for <laughs> VRM design philosophy. It's just like we, we need to be able to kill the CPU more than two times over, and then then the VRM is good enough. <laughs> yeah, um, that, that's basically why I'm such a huge fan of this motherboard. Is just like th this VRM is insane. Now for the SOC VRM, I mean, after like the thing is the V Core VRM here is already ridiculously expensive. So who cares that you're going to put more expensive power stages into the SOC VRM? More 70 amps, more power stages there as well. These chips go for about 3.5 dollars a chip in bulk that is not cheap for comparison you can get like 50 amp normal power stages for a dollar ish uh in bulk so uh yeah these are about three and a half times more expensive than slightly less powerful power stages but admittedly they're also not smart and within the smart power stages category you can actually find power stages under the two dollar mark but uh the thing about those is those are popular with nvidia's founders edition cards and uh well, you won't see them really used on motherboards because the concern is that mother like Nvidia ships so many GPUs that there's a very legitimate concern that if you buy a if you're buying a power stage that is regularly used on reference Nvidia cards, there might be supply shortages. So you don't want to be buying that because you won't be able to keep using it for for very like if Nvidia suddenly has to make a bunch of cards, you're just going to be like, well, we can't make any more motherboards because there's no power stages left for us. Anyway, moving on from the VRM, which, you know, I think is definitely the highlight of this board. Let's go over some other things. So we have dual 8-pin power connectors. You don't need this. <laughs> definitely, like, even for the 12-core Ryzen 3000 series, you definitely don't need two 8-pin power connectors. Um, for the 16-core, you might have to plug in, like, half the... Well, no. You, for the 16 core, you would still be able to get away with the single 8 pin if you have a power supply that has all of its uh, cabling done, in, well, the 8 pins done in 16 gauge wires, because uh, if you have the high current variant of the, this power connector, it's actually 13 amps per pin pair, and basically that's 13 times 4 amps, because this, is, this isn't like a PCIe connector where you have uh, uh, three active pairs and then two sense wires. Um, this is just at, like th this is just ground and 12 volts in there. Um, also, it's worth noting that these power connectors are completely parallel. The 12 volt plane is also shared between the two power connectors. So um, you, you could, if you wanted to do silly things like plug in a four pin here, plug in a four pin there, and technically you'd have like an eight pin, but that's just dumb and you shouldn't do that. Um, you don't need to plug in both of these unless, like or maybe on extreme, if you're maybe pushing the CPU on liquid nitrogen, um, it might make sense to plug in the uh, extra, well, a whole extra 8-pin is not necessary. A Ryzen 3000 is not going to pull a 1,000 watts. Just, like, it's not going to do that ever. Yeah, um, but, you know, high-end motherboards tend to like having unnecessary power connectors, so, yeah, there's no harm in it, and you can definitely plug in, it, plug in the extra power connector if you feel like it. It just won't really make any difference to your overclocking because, uh, 
um, well, one eight pin is more than enough for for powering up to sort of four hundred or even five hundred watts of CPU. At five hundred watts, you're you're starting to get into the you know, you start running into the whole, oh, the cables are starting to get warm, the power connector is starting to get warm, you might want to plug in an extra cable. But up until that point, it's just like, who cares? Run run a single 8-pin. Um, you really don't need two. Um, anyway, so that's that. We've got, a power, uh, we've got a power and reset button on the rear I.O., which in the past I complained about that Gigabyte decided to put it here because if, I'm, if I have my motherboard on a test bench, this is very far away from me and awkward to reach. So Gigabyte thought of me and they added an extra power and, and reset button over here. So we got that covered. Um, <laughs> kind of feels like, like looking at this board and the master, it kind of feels like Gigabyte just made a checklist of things I've complained about on their motherboards in the past. And it's just like, well, that's taken care of. That's taken care of. That's taken care of. Um, Anyway, so we do have, uh, you know, power and reset where they should be, as far as I'm concerned. We've got voltage read points up here. Um, they are just solder bumps, but I understand that Gigabyte really isn't gearing. Like, it, it is called the Extreme, um, and it I might assume this motherboard be, would be quite competent at uh, Extreme overclocking, but Gigabyte definitely doesn't like... There was a time when Gigabyte literally had like an extreme overclocking division of their uh, product development that the that that was a thing. That's where you got all the super overclock and like the OC edition motherboards. Um, yeah, that that's since been scrapped, and uh, this is kind of leftovers from that. The motherboards are really targeted more at gaming, and so you know I understand why they're not bothering with like having proper voltage connectors and and ratio up down buttons, BCLK up down buttons. I really want a motherboard with like voltage control as as buttons on the side, but. Uh, nobody's yet done that, so... We have a single-phase memory VRM, which, uh... So, the, the thing about the single-phase memory VRM is, quite frankly, having a two-phase memory VRM doesn't matter. But th this is Gigabyte's most bog-standard, uh, single-phase memory VRM. Like, they've been using this since, like, at least Z170. And it's fine. It overclocks fine. Ultimately, with, uh, with DDR4, it's less about what you power uh, what you power it with, and more about what you do between the DIMM slots and the CPU socket. So, all of the lovely traces that we see running right here, much more important than what, what you actually power your memory with. But still, this is a bunch of 4C 10N MOSFETs from on semiconductor for all of them. So you have your high side and two low sides. It's a single phase controlled by a rich tech uh, 8120, so RT 8120. Uh, and th this is just like Gigabyte's been running this VRM literally everywhere all the time. And it's fine. Um, the main thing is that honestly, the like the, the single phase memory power, it's just it's not a big deal. But I kind of feel like, you know, since they did this on the, the vCore VRM, they could have done something a little bit more elaborate, but um, ultimately it doesn't matter that much. Um, for the trace layout between the DIMM slots and the CPU socket, we are looking at daisy chain. Uh, historically, Gigabyte is, like, insists on using T-topology on, like, everything. I basically pointed out to Gigabyte, like, hey, uh, your T-topology boards, if somebody's running 2x8, it doesn't overclock very well. And they're like, yeah, but if people want to run 4x8, then, then uh, T-topology works better. For Ryzen 3000, the memory controller has changed, and everybody seems to be going to daisy chain now, Gigabyte included. I'm, I'm interested to see how this works out, because this could be really, really good. Also, if you're wondering about why these are missing, engineering sample motherboard. See that? That's a revision 0.1. Retail boards from Gigabyte are 1.0 or, well, 1 point something. Um, so those are actually populated on the, the retail motherboard. Um, and so, yeah, with the memory overclocking, uh, ultimately you'll have to test it because you can't, like, I can't eyeball trace quality. Um, actually, I'd be really surprised if anyone could eyeball trace quality. <laughs> like, just look at the trace layout and go like, yes, this is a this is a good memory overclocking solution. I'd be very surprised if there was anybody capable of doing that. Here's the thing. You can have the best memory power, de memory power delivery ever. If your trace layout is screwed up, doesn't matter. If your memory training procedures in the BIOS are screwed up, doesn't matter. Like, the, the powering DDR4 is really, really easy. The big problem is maintaining signal integrity to and from the DIMMs. And that com that's mostly about, you know, the trace layout. And then there's also the BIOS, which has to know how to time the, the, the signaling um, with the motherboard. So 
Anyway, moving on from there, we have a right angled 24 pin that Gigabyte's actually pushed in a little bit on the board, um, which I'm a fan of because basically the main concern with the right angled 24 pin power connectors is that this can cause some issues with case compatibility. It would have slightly less issues with cases than if they just had it on the same, you know, just had it pushed out a bit more. We have, of course, a postcode uh, right here. So uh, if you are pushing memory clocks, this gets really, really, well, actually, if you're doing any kind of advanced overclocking, this can be extremely handy because over time, you'll just figure out what errors mean, you know, if this voltage is too low or if some timings are screwed up or if, if you can actually... Uh, over time, th this can be super helpful. Also, some board vendors actually pu publish like cheat sheets for their postcode readouts. So it's like, oh, if you get this postcode, it means this voltage is not high enough or you've really screwed up your memory timings. There there's a few that if you get that postcode, it just means you're wrong <laughs> and you need to go and change everything. Anyway, moving along the, the edge of the board, down here we have a BIOS switch and a BIOS mode switch. So Gigabyte boards, you know, standard feature for them is dual BIOS. Um, main BIOS is actually socketed. This might change for the, well, I've had engineering sample boards come in that had a socketed BIOS, like pictures of engineering sample boards with socketed BIOSes and then the retail ones don't have it, but the high-end retail boards should, should still have a, a socketed main BIOS chip. Um, there's also a backup BIOS chip. And the thing is, um, Gigabyte's dual BIOS is normally implemented as an automatic system where if you fail to post too many times in a row, it'll just go from one BIOS to the other. And when that happens, you know, you'll, it'll look like it wiped all of your BIOS profiles because your BIOS profiles are saved with the BIOS chip. So like, um, the, if you save, like if you're overclocking on the main BIOS, save a bunch of profiles, then fail to post like three times in a row and you end up on the backup BIOS, all of your profiles are still on the main BIOS chip. So that gets really, really annoying really, really quick if you're doing a lot of overclocking and failing to post over and over and over again, which is kind of normal if you're doing lots of, uh, if you're really pushing memory. So Gigabyte acknowledges that this is a problem. And so on their high-end boards, you have a bio, like you have a switch here that basically allows you to disable the automatic uh, BIOS uh, switching system that these boards come with. And then you have this switch over here, which you can use to manually choose which BIOS chip you're on. So you can go between the main BIOS or backup BIOS for, by your own decision instead of relying on the motherboard to, to do it for you. Down here, we have a six pin power connector for extra power to the PCIe slots. This is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this is just straight up wrong, okay? This is like my one major complaint for this whole motherboard is this is done wrong. Th like, how am I gonna put a fourth GPU in here? I mean, third GPU in this PCIe slot if this is plugged in. Seriously, how? Because that power connector sticks straight up. You plug that in and there is no way you're getting another GPU, like there's no way you're getting a PCI card into this PCIe slot. And my and you might be like, oh, but it's useful if you're running two-way SLI. If you're running two-way SLI or two-way crossfire, your GPUs will not be pulling enough power to need the extra PCIe power connector because basically, well, okay, maybe if you really hammered some RX 480s or something, you might need this. But most GPUs are designed with sensible uh, power demands on their PCIe slot. So they won't exceed the 75 watt per slot limit. And the issue with the 70, like the, the, the issue with multi GPU setups is not that they exceed the 75 watt limit per PCIe slot. It's that the 24 pin only has two 12 volt power connectors in it. And those are in charge of powering all of your PCIe slots. Th these are dedicated to CPU power. Um, so normally what happens if you run like a four-way or a three-way setup, um, or well, not normally, but what you can sometimes run into with three-way and four-way GPU setups is that you melt your 24 pin. This exists to solve that, except you can't run three-way or four-way on this motherboard because this blocks the third PCIe slot if you actually try to use it. So yeah, now on the flip side, there's very, like, I don't think anybody's going to actually, like, I'm interested in running three-way and four-way. Most people aren't. So I completely understand that, you know, it's just like this is not this is non-issue for the average, like for real world users for but it's just wrong. Like from a design perspective, this is just wrong. It should not be at this angle. It should be flat. Um, and I, like I get that they don't have enough space here because basically what they're running into with this connector is that if you lay that connector flat, it takes up a lot more space that way and it would basically look something like that and then you'd plug in like so. And uh, well, that, that obviously wouldn't work because your PCIe slot needs to move. 
but they could have put it like here maybe or rearranged the audio section and put it over here which you know i i get that that it's just like that this is this right the way this is implemented it just kind of feels like they they smacked it on there so that they have something to put on the feature list rather than actually making it a useful feature um which is pretty standard practice for a lot of things in the motherboard industry but yeah like ultimately for for normal users this doesn't matter for me this is just uh, from from my perspective this is like why even put it on there if it's going to be implemented wrong um anyway moving on other uh, good things about the motherboard you get 10 gig lan and uh, so that's the Aquantia 10 gig LAN, and you also get uh, 1 gig uh, Intel LAN, and you also get an Intel Wi-Fi card with uh, Wi-Fi 6 on it. So, yeah, and that covers all of the features on this motherboard. This is, uh, yeah, did I mention that the, I did mention that the chips, chipset is passive, didn't I? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I've been trying to, re like, I, I made a mistake in, like, one of my er earlier takes, and had to retake it a bunch, uh, redo this video a bunch of times. Anyway, um, so yeah, that's the X570 Aorus Extreme. Um, probably the best VRM on the entire X570 platform. I don't really think there's any motherboard that gets close to this on the power delivery. Now, does that actually mean this motherboard will overclock your CPU better? Not necessarily, because there's a basically, after you reach a certain level of voltage regulator quality, going past that, doesn't take tend to make much of a difference um if any difference like you know the, and i think this vrm is very well in that area of it just doesn't matter anymore guys there's like the, the x the x570 master you know probably it performs exactly the same in cpu overclocking as this does except the vrm on that will run a little bit warp a little bit warmer um but that's still like the X570 Master is still a true 12 phase. And, and this board is just kind of like, like at this point, it's just showing off. Okay. It's like, look what we can do. And we, when, when we make a motherboard where the, the price tag is basically build the board first, set the price, uh, price tag later. Um, and I appreciate that. Like this is an insane motherboard. Um, it is not a motherboard you need, but it could be a motherboard you want. Um, Cause th this, this is absolutely ridiculous. But the, the question still, of course, remains is like, well, how will the memory overclocking go? Um, because, uh, you know, like if if the memory overclocking sucks, then, you know, the, the VRM, in my opinion, is kind of negated. Um, but uh, yeah, that like memory overclocking is really something you have to actually test in the real world. You can't look at the memory slots or the memory layout topology and and go like, oh, this is good. This is bad just doesn't work um also especially because there's like weird quirks with what the the bios is um what the memory well like there there's so much to memory overclocking that it's i you could write books about it um i couldn't i'm not that good at it but <laughs> some people who are could write books about it and they would go forever anyway so yeah that is the x570 Aorus extreme um and it is very extreme and uh, thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support Gamers Nexus, we've got a Patreon for people who want to support us directly. And there's also store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to, uh, uh, you know, support us by buying merch. Um, and I have another channel called Actually Hardcore Overclocking where I do overclocking things um, with that, that are like longer and more, more in-depth and just completely useless for day-to-day -day users. So you know, <laughs> over that kind of stuff. So thanks for watching and goodbye.